and now on BBC One, everyone's favourite game show. But first, let's remind ourselves of the rules of the competition. The teams are competing against each other to design a small wind turbine with the greatest efficiency, as measured by the power coefficient CP. The turbine can have any number of blades and nose cone design, but must be printed using ABS plastic as one piece and fit inside a box of dimensions 400 by 75 by 150 millimeters. The turbines must rotate clockwise and exhibit a maximum CP below 3000 RPM and add a TSR between 3 and 8. The turbines will be tested at wind speeds of 6, 8, 10 and 12 meters per second and the teams must predict at which speed and TSR their maximum power coefficient will occur. The team that produces the large power coefficient and accurately predicts their TSR will win in the competition. So with no further ado, let's meet this week's team. A horizontal axis wind turbine converts the kinetic energy of air into useful work. A turbine blade is made up of a series of airfoils that produce lift as air passes over them, rotating the blades perpendicular to the wind direction. A turbine's power coefficient, CP, has a maximum value of 0.59, found from conservation of energy analysis. The TSR is an important parameter. Too low and little power is produced, but too high and the turbine becomes aerodynamically inefficient. Right, let's crack straight on and have a look at proof 11 progress in the design process. Coming to the end of the first week of the challenge, and the 20 teams have been working away on their designs. We just found Group 11, let's see how they're getting on. Hi team, Hello. how are you doing? How are we getting on with our initial designs? What can you tell me? So, some of the parameters we've had to decide on were the blade length, tip speed ratio, number of blades, and the type of airform we're using. We've decided to maximise our blade length to take advantage of the significant blockage effect we could achieve in the relatively small wind tunnel. The blockage effect allows us to achieve a significantly high power coefficient as air must squeeze through a smaller area, increasing the local velocity around our blades. To achieve this, we introduced our hinge and our hub so that we could fold the blades while printing it in one piece, allowing us to print blades with a length of 354mm while remaining within the constraint. We did briefly consider one-bladed and three-bladed designs, but decided that they added too much complexity if we were to print it in one piece while folded. So you've chosen your initial design and you've gone for two blades. How did you go about choosing your TSR and your airfill sections? The coefficient of power for a small horizontal axis wind turbine typically picks between 4 to 6, and therefore we have decided to go with TSR of 5. Shortlisted a few air foils with relatively high L over D ratio and uh, at the estimated Reynolds number of 50,000. Rough calculations showed that E62 is unlikely to survive the testing, and so we chose SG6043 as our primary airfoil. As root experience in both stress, we a slightly thicker SG6051 as an airfoil near to the root of our turbine blade. We had to decide on the cord length and the twist of our turbine blades. It's clear that we had to vary the twist along the blades because of the varying local flow velocity direction along the blade. Our blade has a maximum L over D and an angle of attack 8.75 degrees. Thus, we vary the twist of our blade such that local velocity at each section was at an angle. For the selection of cord length, to maximize the efficiency of the turbine, circulation should be approximately constant along the blade. Since the blade velocity is greater nearer to the blade tip, cord length must decrease along the length to keep circulation constant. There are two different theories to help us calculate twist and cord, Brad's theory and the Smith theory. But these two theories only differ near the root. We choose to use Smith theory to help us obtain beta and C cord length, and it is more detailed and considers the downstream rotation of weight. We then use MATLAB to implement blade momentum theory using Smith equations and discretize our blade into 69 parts to obtain cord and twist values at 69 different points of the blade. Q-blade was used to evaluate the performance of our blade, as well as to verify our TSR for max CP. Okay, so we've heard about the aerodynamics so far and it sounds pretty good, but often it's the structures that lets these down. Let's go back and hear about how they're getting on with that. To analyse the structural integrity of our turbine, we've written a MATLAB code to check that the stresses induced are lower than the yield stress of ABS plastic. We've neglected the effects of shear stresses and torsion on the blade since these are small in comparison to the centripetal forces 
and forces created from the bending. In order to analyze these stresses, we have used a MATLAB code and data procured from the aerodynamic design team to discretize our turbine into 69 sections. For each section, the aerodynamic forces are resolved into local, parallel, and perpendicular components. These components are used in the bending analysis, whilst the centripetal forces are calculated at each section by summing the total centripetal forces from the tip inwards. Before the stresses could be analyzed from both bending and centripetal forces, we require calculations of the area and moment of inertia in each section. And using twist to create rotation matrices and chord lengths to scale them, each section is given a set of coordinates defined about the entire blade's neutral axis. Creating this allowed us to use formulae found online to calculate the area and second moment of area for each section. The largest stresses due to bending at each section occur at the greatest distance from the neutral axis. By using this and the moment of inertia values we calculated, the bending stresses were calculated for each section too. Finally, the MATLAB script checks that the combination of the maximum stresses at each section does not exceed the yield stress of the material. We've heard about the aerodynamic and structural considerations of the blades, but there are additional features that can improve the aerodynamic performance. Teams may choose to incorporate these in their design, but the way the blades are attached to the hub is also very important and can make or break any design. Janae and I were in charge of designing the hub and winglets. As we were testing in a low-speed wind tunnel, pressure drag was nearly zero, and so skin friction was the main contributor. Because of this, we decided to minimize our nose surface area. Using a hex series nose cone, we set the parameter C to zero, forming a von Karman curve. With a smaller cone diameter, we were able to increase the total length of the blades. The final consideration in the hub was the hinge mechanism. We decided to print the blades in parallel as a single component in order to maximize the blade length. And have you team decided on any additional features for your design? Yeah, so as the brief uh, specified a bio-inspired feature, we opted for winglets, and we got our inspiration from birds. Um, often they have upturned feathers on the underside of their wings which act as winglets and a winglet works by blocking the high pressure air on the lower surface from moving to the upper surface. In doing so, shed vortices are weaker and the aerodynamic performance is increased. For our winglet characteristics, we referenced a paper involving the CFD analysis of turbine winglets. We decided on a winglet height of 2% of the radius, a curvature of 25% of the height and a 4 degree twist. This combination offered maximum performance without the risk of the blade breaking. The literature suggests that our winglet dimensions would cause a 2% increase in our power. The most important consideration, however, when designing a winglet is to ensure that the wake of one blade doesn't interfere with the aerodynamic characteristics of the second blade. Thanks guys for uh, telling me how I've been getting on. Back to the studio. So the day after uh, the design process, the team were back in our high-tech engineering facility. They were testing and manufacturing their turbines. They were testing and manufacturing their turbines. Let's take a look. Each competing team manufactured a standard aluminium hub by which to attach their turbine to the test frame. This was manufactured using two CNC machines and a manual lathe to create the hexagonal prismatic shape. Group 11 decided to drill additional threaded holes into the hub to allow screws to attach the nose cone and hub, improving structural integrity. The screw heads were milled off to optimize the flow of air over the nose cone. The turbine itself was 3D printed over 24 hours and in a sideways orientation to increase strength. However, since the group's trailing edges were designed in CAD to an infinite point, the blade that was printed from the trailing edge up had to be filled and smoothed with acetone to repair the irregular finish of this trailing edge. Additionally, the hinge on Group 11's turbine was printed solid due to an incorrectly set Z height calibration of the printer, which should be set to 0.127mm. We proved on the CAD model that there was sufficient clearance there and tolerance for the hinge to actually work, but subsequently printing it, it didn't work, but we have since found out that it was the, the Z height calibration that was at fault. The surface finish of the turbine was rough due to limitations of the printer. This roughness degrades the aerodynamic performance of the blades, so Group 11 removed the roughness using increasingly fine grades of sandpaper. The turbine was now ready to be tested. Connected to a torque transducer via a shaft and the power measured by applying a brake force through the shaft, Group 11's turbine turbine was tested at the four wind speeds. Even with resonance experienced at 9 meter per second wind speeds, the group's blades did not break. The team was also successful, as their maximum CP occurred below the threshold of 3000 RPM. An interesting feature of their power curves was the appearance of a hysteresis loop. Group 11's theory for this was that as the blade was decelerating, the wake effects experienced by one blade due to the other changed the effective angle of attack and pushed the blades into the onset of stall, reducing L over D. Re-accelerating the turbine created yet another entirely new weight distribution, which removed the stall behavior, increased L over D, and produced more power for the same RPM. The climax of the show, how Group 11's turbine with me. As you can see in the graphs here, Group 11 experienced their maximum CP at a wind speed of 8 meters per second. The value of maximum CP is also larger than the best limit. This is because of a blockage effect. If the wind turbine was in fact tested in free air and measured, the maximum value of CP would in fact be less than the best limit. We can also see in this table the comparison between the predictions and the actual results of Group 11. Group 11 correctly pre predicted their velocity of maximum CP as 8 meters per second. And their CV is also fairly accurate. However, the TSR for which maximum CV occurred is over 25% out. This suggests that improvements could certainly be made in the future. So, Group 11, if you were to compete in competition again, what would you change? We did have some problems with the printing of the trailing edge as it was too thin there. We should have added some material there so that it could print properly and we could then send it off. We could have added more features to our turbine bit, such as tubicles. It would have reduced the stress concentration at the root if we had a nicer, smoother blend. But we could have also made the root thinner as it seemed that we have over engineered the root. Thanks a lot, Group 11. Now, sadly, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks for watching. Tips, turbines, and turbines. And don't forget to tune in next week.